tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The drug dealers are now brazenly conducting business on the rooftop patio of St. Paul's Hospital. Claims of drug use and drug dealing at a BC hospital. But some staff say the allegations are inaccurate. It's deeply disappointing to see the rhetoric and the false narrative that continues to be spread. And. I know I can't rely on the sun, so I, I knew this was going to be the case. A moment in history we didn't see here. More on the solar eclipse in other parts of the world. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. The province plans to bring in one set of rules around illicit drug use at all BC healthcare facilities. That move comes as BC United claims people are using and dealing drugs inside St. Paul's Hospital. Michelle Gassoub is our top story. The drug dealers are now brazenly conducting business on the rooftop patio of St. Paul's Hospital. BC United making explosive allegations about drug use at St. Paul's Hospital. A concerned nurse says, quote, we know they are drug dealers and yet they come and go. Now the province says it will move to standardize the policies banning illicit drug use at hospitals across all health authorities. There won't be one Vancouver Coastal Health Policy or Fraser Health Policy or Island Health Policy. There will be one policy and we're bringing in a task force to put that in place. BC United claims nurses have described drug use and trafficking, specifically on a rooftop garden at the hospital. Some who work at St. Paul say the allegations being made in the legislature are inaccurate, though extra security has been brought in for the outdoor space. As an addiction medicine physician, I can tell you I've never walked through a cloud of fentanyl. It's stories like this that do a complete disservice to our patients and the healthcare providers who are elbows deep in this work and have been for almost a decade now. St. Paul's is home to a unique peer-run overdose prevention site. The BC Nurses Union says it supports that kind of measure and hopes frontline nurses are on the task force. We believe in harm reduction, uh, but harm reduction should not come at the cost of harming a, a nurse or, or any other healthcare worker. And so, you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to look at the situation critically. The province recently announced it had hired 320 relational security officers to help keep health workers safe. Measures BC United says aren't enough. Putting a task force in place to reinforce rules that they're not enforcing will do nothing. The fact of the matter is, is that people are continuing to use drugs, illicit drugs, inside the hospital, placing other people at risk. But some healthcare workers say hospitals need to be kept out of politics. It's deeply disappointing to see the rhetoric and the false narrative that continues to be spread. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Surrey parents are calling on the province to provide more funding to an early learning program. It's been um, a great experience for my daughter. Uh, she's been able to interact with other kids and just learn, you know, the basics of education. Strong Start is a free drop-in program that helps kids five and younger with language, cognitive, and social skills. It serves about 3,000 children. The Surrey School District says it may have to cut the program because of a funding crunch. It claims provincial funding has been frozen since 2008. BC's Education Minister Rashna Singh says, We are aware of funding pressures and continue our commitment to working with the district to identify solutions. She adds, though, the decision to continue this valued program will be made by the school district, not the province. The BC government says it has asked for an investigation into allegations that a company administering some clean energy programs was soliciting kickbacks. Edison Motors, a merit-based company that builds electric semi-trucks for logging, had been seeking government aid but felt shut out. As Mira Baines explains, it alleges the same company that administers the grants was offering them services to help with write their application. This controversy over alleged kickbacks in doling out clean energy grants has been exploding since last week. The company MNP at the center of the allegations is suspended from administering two clean BC grants. 
Some of you may have seen that we were in the news today as part of a corruption scandal. And I would like to this TikTok video made the rounds over the weekend and amplified allegations that the accounting firm MNP was soliciting kickbacks. Edison Motors builds plug-in hybrid semi-trucks used for logging but failed to earn a grant. This is a grant for people innovating commercial trucks. We're the only ones building commercial trucks. We should apply for this grant. Um, we didn't get the grant. Edison went public about a firm called MNP, which administers clean energy grants, but in some cases also acts as a consultant to help write up applications. The dual roles have the merit-based company asking a lot of questions after it failed to receive grants. But I'm alleging that there's a conflict of interest and we felt pressured into signing up with them if we wanted to receive any grants. On some of the grants, the lowest amount it would have been on one grant would have been $200,000 to write a grant. Other companies were charging five to $15,000. MNP says the allegation that one of its teams in BC worked on both the application process as both the administrator and grant application consultant on the Clean BC grant program are false and misleading. The minister in charge has asked for an investigation into the allegations against MMP, but wouldn't reveal what new information led to the call. This weekend, we received new information that's raised further questions. And as a result, we are asking the Auditor General to undertake a review of MNP's involvement in commercial vehicle grants. The Comptroller General has also been asked to investigate. Allegations against MNP that it was soliciting kickbacks for consulting on applications were raised twice last week in the legislature and the company Edison Motors about a month ago. Now, British Columbians see explosive allegations of corruption that show that carbon tax kickbacks are flowing to NDP-appointed consultants through 20% success fees. The opposition BC United and Conservative Party of BC are questioning why the province hasn't asked for a criminal investigation. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. The provincial government, meanwhile, says a new transit-oriented development is slated for Saanich. The government has bought two parcels of land near transit hubs in the uptown area. It says it wants to ensure people can get affordable homes near public transit. Plans for the site are still in the early stages, but the government says that will be done along with Saanich City Hall. Members of the Haida Nation have approved a landmark agreement with the B.C. government. Under the deal, Victoria recognizes and affirms that the Haida Nation has title to the entire archipelago. The deal will not affect private property, though, and highways and public infrastructure will stay under provincial jurisdiction. The B.C. government says negotiations between industry, the province, and Haida will tackle land use sector by sector. It's becoming more and more evident that the impacts of COVID-19 stretch well beyond actually getting sick with the disease. What's emerged most recently could affect hundreds of thousands of Canadians. As Bell Puri reports, early research suggests a concerning percentage of survivors have been left with a chronic respiratory condition known as pulmonary fibrosis. And I'll watch this. Until recently, the simplest of tasks was a challenge. Two years ago, Farrell Ekman had COVID-19. She was in hospital three months, mostly in ICU, intubated or on a ventilator. The wife, mother of two, recovered but needed oxygen to get up and move around. All the doctors, um, when they had been looking at my scans and seeing what it looked like on the surface of my lungs, they described it as a broken glass kind of appearance. Ekman was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. Hello, hello. Hi. How's it going? Good, thank you. Pulmonary fibrosis is scarring, which causes lung tissue to get thick and stiff. Here there are extra bits of white uh, and dense, dense white bits, and this is the scarring that happens after, after COVID. That scarring makes it hard to absorb oxygen into the bloodstream. We're trying to learn more and more about risk factors that lead some people to end up with scarring after uh, an infection like COVID and other people to kind of get over it without too much of an issue. And I, I think we don't really know the answer to that. And the answer to that it usually lies somewhere in, in genetics. A number of international research teams have identified an escalating rate of pulmonary fibrosis. One study found almost 45% of severe COVID-19 survivors have developed it. That's a significantly higher rate than among the general public. 
Before the pandemic, there were an estimated 30,000 cases in Canada, but the COVID-related pulmonary fibrosis is just surfacing now, so there are no exact numbers to report. Specialists, however, believe worldwide studies accurately reflect cases here. I've seen a fair number uh, most of the time, so I, I would say probably uh, several dozen. Definitely there's more fibrotic lung disease in the COVID pneumonia patients, but not everyone. And in some people, it can level. And in some people, I've had people on oxygen for two years who have now come off oxygen. So you can get improvements. Other than daily oxygen, there's no other treatment for post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis. Farrell Ekman needs it every day. I don't know if I'll ever fully recover. I'm functioning, which is tremendous, um, but, you know, I could possibly be dealing with this for the rest of my life. Do you want to eat maybe around six? As vaccines help to make COVID less severe, it's hoped cases of fibrosis will also lessen. But for now, it's a major concern for survivors and those who treat them. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. With the overcast day we've had here on the south coast, conditions were not ideal for catching a sight of the solar eclipse, but that didn't stop crowds of people from flocking to UBC and the Planetarium Space Centre to try and get in on some of the action. We can't see a whole lot, unfortunately. Uh, Having lived in the Pacific Northwest for a while, I know I can't rely on the sun, so I, I knew this was going to be the case. Uh, I'm a bit jealous of my family in Montreal who is seeing it in full view today. It would have been nice to, to experience to experience it. Uh, we were supposed to get a 28% partial eclipse with the moon blocking part of the sun. And that's still happening, but it's pouring rain here, of course, so we're going to just make the best of it. In 600 million years, we won't, we won't see a solar eclipse anymore because the moon is moving away from the Earth. You can share globally with everybody in the world. It's always a good feeling to have a shared experience, and this is one of our shared experience with my son and with, with the world. Now, while the eclipse might have been a bust here in B.C., in eastern Canada and beyond, depending on where you were, it was quite the event. The CBC science reporter Anand Ram has the highlights. This breathtaking dying of the light captivated people across the entire continent. Early birds crawling in traffic just to get a good spot. I'm trying to have a, a celestial experience, you know? I'm trying to something to touch my soul. We have some uh, badminton sets in the back, some... Uh... What do we buy? Pickleball. Pickleball. Crowds gathered across the eclipse's path from Mexico to the motor speedway in Indianapolis to the mists of Niagara Falls, all for a few minutes of darkness in daytime. It's one of the great natural wonders of the world, one of the great celestial events of the universe, same place, same time, once in a lifetime. And though the clouds over the falls dampen the look of totality, the sound? A crowd still awestruck. It was really cool because like you knew it was just like the mid afternoon, but then it felt like it was like eight o'clock and at night because it was so dark and it was like colder. In Montmagante, Quebec, as darkness descended, spirits lifted. I feel special because we've, we've been driving for six hours to get here. And in New Brunswick, a thousand years since the last one, a crowd left speechless. What, what, what does it look like? Uh, it looks like a... <laughs> it's, it's a... It looks like the third rock on the moon. Yeah. The full effect was brief across the continent, just a few minutes, but a rare chance because even though the whole thing is about the sun being blocked, it's also one of the best chances to study it. There are so many people that are engaging with this eclipse, doing professional science. Why the sun's corona, the outermost atmosphere, is hotter than the surface, how the solar wind, how that is born, and even how animals behave in response to the eclipse. But above all, for scientists and citizens alike, it was a moment to savor the moment. This really I hope gives us all pause as we ponder what I like to call our place in space, our relationship to the cosmos. A chance in darkness to see the world in a new light. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. Kara Sog joins us with our first look at the weather. I did not feel special today. The only corona I saw was a beer in my fridge, but there we go. <laughs>
Good for you. <laughs> you know, hopefully really? that brought you some joy. I don't yeah, know if there it was celestial joy. Oh, but, maybe, yeah. I put a lime in it, so that time. You know, yeah, 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 good for yeah. you. That's great. Uh, well, yes, uh, here on the south coast, we did not have optimal uh, viewing conditions no. for the solar eclipse. Uh, we were going to, you know, it was a partial solar eclipse mm -hmm. here anyway, right? Uh, but taking a look here, this is where uh, 1135, kind of the peak of that was for us. You can see lots of precipitation. Uh, lots of cloud cover too for much of the province. Uh, looking forward though, we are going to dry out a little bit. So we've got precipitation forecast overnight Tuesday into Wednesday, uh, overnight tonight into Tuesday rather, things are going to dry out and Wednesday is actually looking like a fairly dry day for us on the south coast. Taking a look at this evening, 7.55 p.m. is our sunset. We're going to have rain this evening. We're not going to see the sunset uh, about eight degrees, getting down to seven overnight but that's when the rain is going to stop and we're looking at a dry but cloudy start to tomorrow. I'll be back later on in the show with another look at weather. Sounds good. Thanks, Karis. Still ahead, we begin our series on wildfires and speak with our CBC Health columnists about how you can protect yourself this summer. Stick around. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. Tomorrow marks six years since the Humboldt Broncos bus tragedy. 16 people were killed and 13 seriously hurt when a semi drove through a stop sign into the path of the team's bus. Now a surviving member has qualified for the 2024 Paris Paralympics in rowing. More now from Karen Pauls. Yeah, I've been on a fast track. The last six years have been a blur for 24-year-old Jacob Wasserman, the former starting goaltender for the Humboldt Broncos. He is one of the 13 survivors in the April 2018 crash that left 16 others dead after a semi ran through a stop sign into the path of the team's bus. How sweet the sound. This tragedy has devastated our families, our Humboldt Broncos organization. The crash left Wasserman paralyzed from the navel down. This horrible thing did happen a long time ago, but we got no other choice but to just keep moving forward and keep living life and just making the best out of it. Wasserman tried sledge hockey and water skiing, but checked out rowing after a friend recommended it. So I just decided to go and give it a try. And the boat was awkward and kind of weird to figure out at first, but rowing on the river here in Saskatoon was just quite the, quite the place to learn. Last year, Wasserman won gold in the men's PR1 single category in the Canadian Championships. He recently won silver in Brazil. Because of that, Canada earned a spot at the Paris Games and Wasserman qualified. He isn't on Team Canada yet. The qualifying period isn't quite over and the team won't be named until June, but... I can say it's very likely that you will see his name on our nomination. He's only spent one season on the water, um, which is remarkable. I think it's a testament to who he is as an athlete. Some of his former Broncos teammates aren't surprised. Double trace up or pallet Jacob is his ability to balance back, his work ethic, his determination. Like when he does something, he wants to do it well. He doesn't want to just half do it. He wants to go all in with it. And so to see him do this for rowing and to keep on crushing it is super inspiring. It's incredible what he's been able to do and achieve. He's going to continue reaching all his goals and inspiring others on that journey. And no other person more deserving than him. He, he works hard for his goals. And I know that me and the boys are going to support him along the entire journey. So very, very proud of him. Wasserman says he's blown away by all the support. The Paralympics and the Olympics in general has always been like one of the biggest stages in the world. And it's like, oh, well, maybe someday we'll get there. So it's, uh, it is really cool that we might be getting closer to that dream that I've had for so long of leave the disability at the dock and I just get to go out and perform and be an athlete and do my thing. The 2024 Paralympics run from August 28th to September 8th. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg.
Canada's national dental care plan is set to start next month. It's supposed to cover low- and middle-income seniors who don't have private insurance. But as Marina von Stackelberg tells us, some dentists have decided not to sign up. No pain on any of the implants at all? Mm -mm. Coverage under the Canadian dental care plan starts next month. This denturist says it will really help his senior yeah, patients. Right it's something that most of our clients are going to be affected by. Um, we're happy to, to be part of it, especially if it works the way it's supposed to. So far, 1.6 million seniors have enrolled. Ottawa will only say thousands of oral health care providers have registered to treat them. Dental associations warn participation is low. Case in point, their presidents, working dentists themselves, tell CBC News they won't run the program in their own practices. My staff have told me, in no uncertain terms, they don't want to do the program because they, they just cannot handle the extra burden that comes with it. They say dental offices are thinly staffed and can't handle the paperwork Ottawa requires to process claims. Plus, they don't know what they're signing up for. Unlike other dental plans, this federal program is asking the dentist to sign a contract that's like seven pages long with a lot of unknown factors and unnecessary terms and conditions. Some seniors are shocked to find out their dentist won't take part. What does it mean for me? I've just got to continue paying. I just have the minimal, minimal amount of things done. It really irks me that the federal government came out and announced a dental plan, but they didn't do their homework to get the thing in place so that my dentist could be part of it. But Ottawa may be looking to sweeten the deal. We're working actively on creating an alternative portal uh, that will allow dentists uh, to uh, participate uh, uh, just directly when a patient comes in front of them to just put in the information and be able to put that claim. Another sore spot for dentists and patients, the federal government initially pitched this as free dental care. But only some procedures are covered and at a lower rate than many clinics charge. So you should still expect to see a bill when you leave the dentist chair. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. It may be rainy today on the south coast, but BC's wildfire season has begun. This week we're looking at what's being done to prepare for the fires and learn from lessons past from last year's fire season. Our health columnist, Dr. Melissa Lem, joins us now. Thanks for being here. You have been, you've worked in northern BC and, and during past wildfire seasons. In that time, what stood out to you? I have. Well, I've worked extensively in northern BC and in Yellowknife, which was just evacuated last summer during mm -hmm. the wildfires. And I've been there during smoke events where you step outside and it's like you're in front of a smoky campfire blasting in your face. And certainly I see lots of health impacts on the people who work there. So for example, I see kids coming in with asthma exacerbations, people with worse mental health, depression and anxiety, and also people with chronic diseases like heart and lung disease, and also outdoor workers, including firefighters, coming in sicker. And I will mention there are real impacts on, on healthcare workers too. So I was meant to work in, in Yellowknife at the end of last, last summer, mm -hmm. and my stint there was cancelled at the very last minute but for a while I thought I was going to have to go and leave my family behind so there are real impacts on a large number of people within the healthcare system and within our patients as well. You mentioned a, a, a large swath of people there is there any group that you saw and in general particularly the most vulnerable? Mostly people with chronic heart and lung conditions, and there's a lot of evidence showing that people with lung disease like COPD and mm -hmm. asthma have worse exacerbations. And we also see more episodes of abnormal heart rhythms and also heart attacks coming in during wildfire smoke events. How many of those, you mentioned mental health, how many people mentioned that, that feeling of just, I mean, it was bad enough here on the south coast where there were fires that were close but not evacuation close. What about that weight of, that people were feeling? Something that I really see is not necessarily people saying I'm concerned about the smoke necessarily, but something that I do see is, is just higher rates of people calling into my office, coming into my office with anxiety and depression. And the reason is likely that they can't, for example, head outside and improve their health in that way and relieve their stress in that way. But also wildfire smoke directly crosses the blood brain barrier and causes inflammation and can worsen mental health directly that way. And you, in terms of mitigation, if somebody can't move, if they're, uh, depending on their circumstance, what are some steps they can take to try to relieve some of the impact of wildfires? 
Well, in your home, you can, for example, keep your doors and your windows shut during smoke events and also run air purifiers. If you have to head outside, wear an N95 mask. Mm -hmm. And then avoid worsening air pollution inside your own home during smoke events. So, in fact, not burning candles, avoiding vacuuming, and avoiding using your gas stove because that puts air pollution right into your kitchen. And then around your home, if you live in a fire-prone area, keeping flammable and combustible materials away from your home, planting fire-resistant shrubs and trees. There are lots of good tips, actually, on on different websites online. And then last but not least, a lot of us can work together societally to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels because that's driving climate change, which is worsening wildfires. So there are so many things we can do on many levels to, pre to prepare ourselves, but also evidence does show that when we make a plan and when we prepare, we feel less anxious about wildfires too. And that helps physically and mentally. That's right. All right, Dr. Melissa Lem, we appreciate your time and expertise as always, thanks. Thanks, Dan. The Vatican has issued new doctrine on gender-affirming surgery, describing them as violations of, quote, human dignity, the backlash against the church and the pope after this. What is a henna, basically? Mm -hmm. Henna is made out of the leaf of a plant. Uh, they take the leaf, they dry it, and make it into a powder. So mm -hmm. we take that powder and we convert it into, you could say, icing. And we use that icing to draw on people. And then it leaves a beautiful stain on your skin that can last from four days to two weeks. Now, the problem with these cones is um, the henna itself does not have any shelf life. If it's created naturally, it doesn't have any shelf life. Mm -hmm. So what these companies do is to extend the shelf life, they add chemicals into these cones, which are really really, really dangerous for your skin. Um, one of the things that they add is the kerosene oil. Yes, the thing that we put in our cars. So because of the chemicals in it, if you're using those chemical cones, you can absolutely get a reaction from it, even if you're not getting a reaction today or tomorrow. So when you heard about this uh, Health Canada warning, uh, mm -hmm. what did you think and, wh and what did they say? Personally, I was very happy about it because we have been asking Health Canada to do something about these cones for a long, long time. And you would imagine that, you know, if something is being sold in Canada on the shelves, it must be safe, right? Right. Uh, it's not really, no. No. So no. this crackdown is welcomed by people exactly. who are doing it yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely. How regulated is the henna industry in Canada? It is not regulated. That's the whole issue. It is really hard for them to regulate henna itself. So that's why it is important to let the consumer know what is it that they should be looking for when they go out and get henna done. So we're approaching the summer festival season as well. We're going to see a lot of henna in those festivals. So it is really important that you be asking these questions. Is it natural? What did you put in it? Did you make it yourself?
High-level bureaucrats have begun testifying into the public inquiry into foreign interference in Canada's elections. The so-called Panel of Five was tasked with watching for meddling, analyzing how serious it was, and as Rafi Bujikani it explains, deciding whether to issue public warnings. This is the last line of bureaucrats monitoring foreign interference into Canadian elections, and for both of the previous two votes, they decided not to sound a public alarm. This uh, threshold was very high, and there are important reasons uh, for that. Um, first of all, because there's, there was some risk that any intervention by uh, the panel can create more arms than, than good. It had, it had the potential to create confusion and also to be seen as interfering in a democratic uh, exercise. Um, and we want also to make sure that we were not uh, being seen as taking a position, a partisan position. A rebuke to testimony last week by former Conservative leader Ernold Toole. He maintains his party may have lost five to nine writings to misinformation orchestrated by the Chinese government unhappy with its strong stance on Beijing's human rights record. Do you agree that every voter's vote in Canada in a federal election matters? Absolutely. And do you also agree that it also matters if even one vote is jeopardized, suppressed or threatened because of evidence of foreign interference that you, you may have before you? I agree with that. Today, the Conservatives' lawyer tried to make the panel confess the partial intel they had received about 2019 should have met that threshold. Intel like how there may have been a transfer of at least $250,000 from unknown People's Republic of China officials to some election candidates. The panel maintaining that would have been for the Commissioner of Canada elections to act on. So in your view, they, if, if, if the evidence was con concrete, they should have done something about it? Yes, I believe that uh, the due course of action would have happened. The panel did say it recommended the Liberal Party be briefed privately about intelligence it received in connection with then-Liberal MP Han Dong's nomination race in the Toronto riding of Don Valley North, something it considered to be one proper means of mitigation. It also asked for CSIS to continue to monitor and feed it information. Some members of the Prime Minister's inner circle are up next at the inquiry. Rafi Bujikani, NCBC News, Ottawa. The federal government has now pledged billions of dollars to modernize Canada's military with a focus on bolstering Arctic sovereignty. It's in response to heightened tensions arising from the war in Ukraine. As Murray Brewster reports, it will include new submarines, long-range missiles and early warning aircraft. Canada's military is due for an upgrade and Ottawa says it's ready to spend billions to do it. Today... We are announcing our next commitment to our armed forces and to Canadians' security. It makes $73 billion worth of investments over the next 20 years. Much of that investment comes down the road. In the short term, roughly $8.1 billion will be invested over the next five years with emphasis on the Arctic. This new strategy, the result of a long-awaited defence review ordered two years ago after Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukrainian cities and infrastructure have been pounded by Russian missiles. To guard against that, Canada will invest in early warning airborne surveillance planes. Canada also hopes to purchase a tactical missile system similar to what the U.S. has given Ukraine. Another priority, submarines, to replace the nearly 40-year-old Victoria-class boats. The Prime Minister suggested it is not a question of if the Navy will get them, but when and how many. But we also know there is more to do. For example, we talk about uh, exploring and defining the submarine capabilities we're going to need to patrol and protect our Arctic in the coming decades. Canada has been under pressure from allies to increase defence spending to meet NATO's target of 2% of GDP. This plan only gets the country to 1.76% by 2029. And that is if everything goes OK, according to this defence expert. It's like most of our policy documents, it's a statement of intent. And I think it'll very much have to be checked against delivery. I think the implementation of our defense policies has, in my opinion, been the real struggle. Other experts agree and say Canada's business as usual approach, such as taking two years to rewrite the defense strategy, won't work anymore. And in light of Ukraine, the government will have to deliver on the commitments and swiftly. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. The 
Vatican has released a new doctrine highlighting what it calls violations to human dignity, some deemed extremely dangerous. Stephanie Skanderis now with what's on that list and why the Pope's take on gender has enraged some. As the Pope met with families of Israeli hostages, new documents he approved were creating controversy. Ma all'inizio di questo tema, delivered by Argentinian Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, they outline what the church constitutes as human dignity, along with a list of grave violations, among them poverty, violence against women, and war. It opposes the criminalization and persecution of people who are gay. But it also opposes gender-affirming surgery and includes a section called gender theory, which it says is extremely dangerous. I think they tried to walk that fine line to say, you know, there are certain cases that have to be looked at, there has to be a sensitivity to the situation, but as a kind of broad position, uh, the, the Vatican is saying no to that. Some within the church say the Vatican having that position seems at odds with Pope Francis's recent attempts at inclusion, like announcements that transgender people can be baptized and be godparents, and that priests can bless same-sex couples. Those who support greater 2S LGBTQ plus rights in the church weren't pleased with the doctrine. The danger of, of the, the Vatican making such statements is that they give license to all of the homophobes and transphobes around the world. Uh, and that results in uh, terrible harm. Well, just definitely not helpful. Susan Gapka works to support 2S LGBTQ plus people in Toronto. She says the Vatican's new doctrine takes her back 60 years. I would hide. Uh, my emotions and my feelings. If it's about dignity, they would talk to trans children, trans people like myself. Gapka says her works will continue no matter what the Vatican says. Yeah, like Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Displaced residents in southern Gaza are returning home to Khan Yunus after Israel pulled most of its ground troops from that area. People are coming back to find a devastated city. It's estimated 90% of homes and buildings are damaged or destroyed in the six months of fighting. The area has come under heavy bombardment in recent months in Israel's war against Hamas militants. The Israeli military says the withdrawal leaves just one brigade there. It's been reducing troops in Gaza since the start of the year to relieve reservists. It comes amid growing pressure from its ally, the U.S., to improve the humanitarian situation. IDF officials say troops are regrouping as the military prepares to move into Rafah. The Global Atomic Energy Watchdog is warning about the risk of a major nuclear disaster in Ukraine. Russia says there was a drone strike on the power plant in Zaporizhia on Sunday. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirms one of the reactors was hit. There was no breach, but three people were hurt. Ukraine and Russia are blaming each other for the attack. Independent ver verification is difficult because heavy fighting has put the region off limits to reporters. The facility is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. It's been under Russian control since the early days of the invasion. After the break, a photographer is on a mission to capture a master of disguise in BC's Rocky Mountains. We take you to a week-long winter trek in search of the elusive white-tailed ptarmigan. You'll want to see this. When Jafar Jabera found out his eight-year-old daughter was given TB medication at school, he was shocked. Even more shocking was that she didn't have TB. I'm sad that I let my daughter down and I wasn't told about this or, or given any consent. Like, I'm, I'm the parent. And they took my daughter away and they gave her medication without informing me and continued to do so. Behind a parent's back? Jabera says his daughter was given five doses from a public health assistant over three months as part of a screening clinic at Jomi's school late last year, but he said he was only told about it in January. In an email obtained by CBC News dated January 24th, addressed to Jabera and his partner, Nicola Titi, the manager of Akulawit Public Health, or IPH, told the couple a day after finding out what happened. They met with IPH the day after and were offered a TB test. Since then, the couple say they haven't heard from IPH. For Atiti, the current system reminds her of similar practices that existed in residential schools. She calls it ongoing colonization. How can 
I feel confident in sending children to school or confident in going to the hospital when our experiences have been so horrible. The Department of Education declined interview requests and the Department of Health declined to comment on Jabera's daughter's case. But Nunavut's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Sean Wachtel, did say an internal review of TB processes is underway. We are endeavouring to do things very differently now, um, whilst recognising trauma from the past that is still present, um, yet still try to effectively treat the disease. While IPH promised to no longer give medicine at school, Ititi and Jabera said it should have never happened, adding that they want policies changed and people to face consequences. TJ Deer, CBC News, Iqaluit. We're sharing really important information with the public, and I feel like this is exactly what our job is, especially as the public broadcaster, especially in morning radio. That's incredibly important. So I know when I really like a song, if within the first three seconds, I'm already vibing to it. Hey, I'm Rohith Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. It's not one person dictating what good music is, it's the community sharing what good music is. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. The warmer than normal weather in parts of BC this winter means most flowers are already in full bloom at this year's Abbotsford Tulip Festival. As Saurabh Sandhu reports, the event opened this weekend a week earlier than usual. Red, white, yellow and purple. Rows upon rows of tulips are on display at Lakeland Flowers in Abbotsford. The colors are just incredible. It's just a sea of colors here. The flowers are so nice. For owner Nick Warmerdam, the annual Tulip Festival is a time to sit back with his best friend Diesel by his side to take in what he calls a labor of love. He's been growing tulips for three decades. This uh, land, uh, because it uh, was reclaimed from a lake, the soil is quite sandy and that makes it a, a lot easier for us to sift all the bulbs out of the soil uh, during the summer when we have to harvest them. Last year, the festival made a triumphant return after most of Warmer Dam's bulbs were destroyed in the devastating floods of 2021. Warmer Dam says this year the milder winter temperatures saw flowers blooming earlier than usual. Five million tulips to be exact. We had four or five days of weather in the 20 degree, 20, 20, it was around here, it was 23, 25 degrees. And with a tulip bulb, the uh, they react very quickly to the weather, to temperature. So um, uh, we are ending up with an early start. Visitors can expect to see more than 100 varieties of tulips, 30 of them new this year. Some bulbs brought in all the way from Netherlands. We might switch, uh, get, uh, change some of the varieties for new ones, but I, think, uh, I, I don't think I can manage having more than 100 varieties or other, otherwise I'm going to get mixed up. 
Amongst the flowers are scenic photo backdrops, like at this canoe or on these swings. Warmer Dam says last year's festival attracted more than 56,000 people to his farm. We're going to have to see whether we, whether the Mother Nature is going to keep the tulips looking nice all the way till Mother's Day or not. The cooler it is, the longer the flowers stay looking nice in bloom. The festival usually stretches until Mother's Day, but Warmer Dam is concerned with the early start. They may not last as long. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Abbotsford. Well, today's rain is bound to bring out yet more flowers. There was some disappointment today for anyone hoping to get a glimpse of that eclipse, as we showed you. So has the rain got you bummed? We hit the streets to find out. And here we thought it was summer. <laughs> How has the rain ruined your plans today? Oh, no. Uh, I mean, every day is an awesome day, uh, so nothing's ruined whatsoever, you know. Uh, but back to uh, typical Vancouver. Does the weather, Vancouver weather, ever ruin your plans? It does, especially when you're with some Debbie Downers. Yeah. You know, I just can't appreciate it. Okay, like we saw, you put some weather gear on, and then you hope for the best. Just like the other day, the evening, it was a day like today, had a little bit of rain, and the evening, we had a beautiful sunset. Well, I just returned from a trip to Mexico. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm, feel I'm feeling it, trust me. Like, this is, oh, yeah, but I'm dealing with it. I absolutely hate it. I'm like, I'm a very um, sunny kind of person, so like, anytime it's raining, I'm already like, ugh. I live in Poco, so it's kind of hard to drive all the way here. We were hoping to see the eclipse, but the weather ruined the eclipse. Watch, watch it on YouTube. Or CBC News Network across the country, Kara Sog, which caught, did you see any of that? They bounced I, yes. around all the... Wasn't that awesome? It, wa it looked very cool. So good. And for yeah. the record, we need this rain. We do. So, I mean, you and I are from here, so we're used to this, but come on, get on board, people. Yeah, exactly. You know <laughs> what? It is... The rain is a good news story. Mm -hmm. It just it just kind of put a damper on the yeah. whole uh, solar eclipse viewing thing yeah. that we were hoping 28%. For, right? <laughs> mm. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So looking at our satellite and radar over the past 12 hours, uh, you can see here at the time, 1130 Pacific time when, you know, that partial solar eclipse was happening, uh, quite a lot of cloud cover over the province and also quite a bit of precipitation. A lot on uh, Vancouver Island, actually. The green is the rain, the white is the snow, and, uh, and it was happening quite a bit. There's a frontal system that was pushing across the BC coast today. And so uh, that's, that's what got in the way of our viewing. But taking a look at the precipitation forecast for uh, tonight into tomorrow and then also Wednesday, things are going to start to dry out. It looks like on Wednesday, much of the province will have actually kind of a break in the precipitation. Uh, but just a heads up that there are two highway alerts to be aware of uh, for the Trans-Canada Highway Rogers Pass to... Um, uh, no, no, Rogers Pass, and I'm blanking on it's where okay. it's... okay. What's anyway, the other one? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Trans-Canada Highway around Rogers Pass, be aware that there's heavy snow expected tonight and actually tomorrow afternoon, about 10 to 20 centimetres accumulating. Uh, but then also Coquihalla Highway near the summit, heavy snow is expected uh, overnight tonight and into tomorrow. So be aware of that. Tomorrow, looking at the daytime highs, uh, we've got Whistler, chance of snow, uh, tonight, also a chance of snow in Golden, and uh, the highs, you know, pretty pretty average. Nine for Prince George. Dee's Lake is looking at four. Bella Coola ten. Cranbrook eleven. And taking a look now at uh, Metro Vancouver, our five-day mm -hmm. forecast clearing up overnight tonight. Well, not clearing, just drying out, mm -hmm. but clearing tomorrow afternoon, and we might start seeing the sun into Wednesday. Chance of showers Thursday, and drier again on Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. But okay. you know what? This time of year, the weather yeah. changes very frequently. So April showers, yada, yada, yada. Yada, we'll yada, fine. yada, yada. Thanks, Gareth. Yes, no problem. An elusive bird that spends its entire life at high elevations captured the imagination of one photographer. He became obsessed with catching a glimpse of the white-tailed ptarmigan in its natural, often harsh, habitat. Photographer Leron Gertzman spent seven days trekking through BC's Rocky Mountains in the winter in hopes of spotting it. 
At the tops of the mountains lives this elusive chicken-like bird called the ptarmigan that changes its feathers to blend in with its surroundings throughout the seasons. So in the summertime, they're brown to blend in with the rocks, and in the winter, they're pure white to blend in with the snow. There's three species of ptarmigan. I photographed all three, the rock, the willow, and the white-tailed ptarmigan, but I'm still looking for a shot of the white-tailed ptarmigan that really captures the bird within the context of its winter environment with the snow-covered mountains in the background. I'm on a journey to try to get that shot. I do think like a lot of the best photos ever taken of wildlife have one thing in common, and that's that the photographer had a vision and they pre-planned what they were going to do in order to get the shot. Sometimes you fail and you don't pull it off. Um, and sometimes you succeed exactly how you envisioned. And sometimes you like succeed in that you get a really interesting shot, but it's very often not exactly what you had in mind. Mission ptarmigan, not going too well, to be honest. <laughs> um, haven't seen any signs. So the last time I can remember there not being lots of snow in the mountains at this time of year was maybe 2015. There was so little snow in the mountains that year that it made finding the ptarmigans easier because they just stood out on the rocks because there was no snow, they had no camouflage. But it's so beautiful out here, really having a nice time. Staying warm, um, eating some warm food out of a bag, and yeah, it's great. <laughs> Second day getting up at five in the morning. Yeah, uh, if you were to uh, give us a number, like what, what is the percent chance of seeing a ton again? I know I may have thrown around a number of like 45% chance earlier, but I think it's maybe more like 4.5. <laughs> um, we're really looking for a needle in a haystack or a, a snowflake in a snow mound. <laughs> uh, beautiful blizzardy conditions, maybe not the best for searching, but, uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. This looks like some good ptarmigan food. <laughs> Bits of vegetation sticking out of the snow. Close to a thousand meters of vertical elevation gain to conquer here. Well, we're back at it. Out, we headed further east into the Rockies, uh, following up on some reports actually that ptarmigan were seen in this area not too long ago. So we're up here at the tree line. Whew. As soon as I lower that, I feel the uh, <laughs> cold wind on the face. Wow. Obviously, a bird surviving up here needs a bunch of unique adaptations to make that survival possible. One really cool thing I love about ptarmigan is that they have built-in snowshoes. So if you look closely at their feet, they actually have feathers growing all the way down their feet. And that's not something we see in a lot of birds. This is an ecosystem that is being impacted by climate change. Um, and in response to climate change, birds kind of have a couple options if they're gonna move. They can move poleward, or they can move up the mountain. And this is something that has been documented with a lot of species, is as things get warmer, the plant communities on the mountain grow further upslope, and the birds will move with them further upslope. But what happens to the species that already live at the top of the mountain? Oh, hang on, what are those tracks? Hang on. Oh my God, those are ptarmigan tracks. Have some beautiful ptarmigan tracks here. It was snowing yesterday, so these are probably pretty fresh. Um, you can actually see a bit of a wing print here where the bird landed, walked over this way, probably had a bit of a snack on the willows, continued to those willows, walked to those willows, and then the tracks disappeared, so it probably flew off there. Um, but this is really great to see. Like, I don't think people get into wildlife photography because they feel the need to tell a story about a major conservation issue. I feel like for most people, they get into it because they just love wildlife, and that's kind of where it starts. You know, like, we, we almost have this duty as wildlife photographers to, like, utilize those photos to try to give back in a way. <laughs> like, I'm not acting like wildlife photographers are heroes, right? Like, we photograph wildlife. We're very, very lucky and privileged to be able to do so. The goal is to capture a photo that gets people to think and consider how special this animal is, that we should care about this animal, and that it, it, exists, in, 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 it exists deliberately in the place that it exists.
Oh, that's a good shot. I'm happy with that. <laughs> you know, you go out searching for ptarmigan, a couple ravens fly in and you end up with basically the shot that I wanted to get with the ptarmigan, just with the raven. Um, and it's gorgeous. <laughs> like 100% worth the trip. That's how it happens. Speaking of birds, we have a winner. Was it the raven or the Annis hummingbird that flew to the top of the battle to be named BC's best bird? We will reveal all after this. There are a lot of great things about being a kid. So many opportunities and dreams, so many activities and hobbies to try, so many expectations and pressures. Sometimes it can all start to feel like too much. This is Kane Explains Burnout. Burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion. It's caused by too much stress over an expended period of time. But why does it happen? Imagine this jug of water is your life. It's already pretty full. And then you start to add on more, like passing your math exam, making the volleyball team, the pressure from your family, keeping up with online trends, and then add more, like maybe a sick family member, or worrying for money, a new school. It all adds up. And if there's too much, As a young person, you may feel pressured to succeed. Some of us think if we just do more, try harder, then we'll get everything we want and please everyone around us. But when expectations don't match reality, that can end in... Total burnout. The mind and body can only handle so much. Think of it like a half bar in a video game. When it's full, you're all good, you're handling things. But we don't have unlimited energy. Here are some signs that you're pushing your limits and could be on your way to burnout. Losing motivation, even to do things you once loved. Isolating yourself, not wanting to hang out with friends and family. Maybe you're on edge, snapping or getting annoyed easily. Feeling worthless, sad, or on the extreme end, depressed. So what can you do? Try breathing exercises. It might seem silly, but taking a moment to just breathe and making space for yourself can help. Find a healthy outlet. Find a healthy way to cope. Like for me, I like to play the piano really fast and very loudly. Talk to someone you trust. Your support system is super important. Take a break, especially from things you find most stressful. Like it could be dropping activities or limiting your time on social media. It doesn't have to be forever. Find a balance that works for you. Because that's the thing, every kid is different. The key is self-compassion. Be kind to yourself, think about your needs. We can be our own worst critics. So cut yourself some slack. You got this. And that's it for Kane Explains. I'm Sabavid Yusufi. Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver returns as the exclusive media partner of the Doxa Documentary Film Festival May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations and industry events. For festival program and tickets, visit doxafestival.ca and never miss a special programming series, event or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter and keep connected with us. Mount Etna, the largest active volcano in Europe, blew circles of gas into the sky over Sicily on the weekend.
The so-called smoke rings filled the sky when a crater opened on the summit of the volcano. Events like this are rare, but Mount Etna emits more volcanic vortex rings than any other volcano on the planet. Mount Etna is the highest peak in, the, in Italy, south of the Alps. Alps. And as we told you last week, the Wildlife Rescue Association of BC has been running a contest to decide the best bird in our province. And a new Lord of the Wings has been crowned. 32 of the coolest birds in BC went head to head in a March Madness style bracket. And Anna's hummingbird emerged as the champion. Dun, da, da, da. Organizers hey. say the final bracket was a close one, but assured everyone there was no <coughs> foul play. <laughs> And it was actually <laughs> neck and neck. Um, they only had, I believe, nine votes difference. Plus. On its way to the crown, Anna's hummingbird had to beat the black-capped chickadee, the American kestrel, the ruddy duck, the belted kingfisher, and finally, the majestic raven. Organizers say they're looking forward to running it again next year. But can Anna's hummingbird win next year? I don't know. You know what? You know, it would take like, a year off. It, well, maybe. <laughs> it, would, it would battle you in a very cute way, though. Yeah, it sure would. To. Don't tell Canuck. All right. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Join us at 11. Take care.